um, this is the guy that we're going to be talking about, Le Chatelier. And um, we're going to uh, talk about how, what he did, what he studied, and a tiny bit of history about him. So he was born in Paris back in the 1800s to a family of architects and engineers. And he received his early training in math and chemistry from his own dad. And he spent most of his life in Paris writing scientific papers, books on metal alloys, steel, clay, and ceramics. So because his family was in this whole architecture engineering business, he ended up having to be around different substances. A lot of times people will say, what does, what does something like interior design and architecture have to do with chemistry? And I'll tell you that my sister-in-law, who just graduated from Lawrence Tech, ended up having to take a class, multiple classes, in both chemistry and also in physics. What does that have to do with anything? Why does that have to do with, what does that have to do with chemistry? Why would you, how are those two related? When you're talking about architecture, for example. Anything? You can, you can say, I know it's, you don't want to say the wrong answer. It's okay, nobody knows you. What's that? Anybody? What do you know about structures? Um, what are they made of? Well, like brick, right? So they can use it a lot. Steel, maybe clay, maybe yeah. brick. And what are those made of? Elements. Atoms, elements, molecules, okay? And so because of that, having a good understanding, you don't want to make you, you want to make sure that when you go to build something, that your building's going to be sound and it's not going to collapse in 10 years. And so there is actually a lot of physics and chemistry. Maybe the rooftop that you're trying to choose, you want to make sure that as far as the temperature goes, whether you're building in Arizona or you're building somewhere in Michigan, whether it's a hotter climate or a cooler climate, you may choose a different type of rooftop that maybe absorbs a certain amount of energy differently. So that's something that we'll talk about later on when we talk about specific heat. We did a little tiny bit of specific heat. We're going to do a whole unit on it, which is called thermochemistry. Thermal, what stem is that? Thermo. Yeah, talking about heat and energy changes, because there's a whole unit of chemistry that's on that. His biggest scientific accomplishment, the biggest thing that he did, though, was he studied shifts of equilibrium. And what he did was he called all of these stresses. We all have different stresses, especially now coming to the end of the semester. We all have very different stresses. What are some of the things that you do to relieve your stress? You can just call these out. Sleep, good? Eat. Eat. Yeah. Eat. Here's something else. Boxing. Boxing, so like exercise, basketball, sports. I'm going to tell you that the interesting thing is, um, I heard earlier yesterday when I did this with class, there was, when I asked them what their stresses were, someone raised their hand and said that sports were their stress. Does anybody, does your sports cause you stress? Is this, is this true for anyone? I'm seeing a bunch of hands go up here. Okay. Um, there was another thing that could be a stress reliever and that could be a stress. Is there something else that could be a little bit of both too that in your own lives where you're like, you know what, that could be a stress reliever for some people, but for me it's causes stress. Music, okay, playing an instrument. And I will tell you that my own son, this happened, he had, he loves playing the guitar, okay? And the thing is, I pretty much tell him like around a half hour a day, 20 to 30 minutes a day is what he basically plays. Now, he's not gonna be some amazing performer, at least, I, I'm not sure, maybe he will. I just, I, we don't plan on this. He's, he's very smart and, and he could do a whole bunch of different things and maybe that's something he'll end up wanting to do. But we decided, his instructor said that um, he wanted him to go and play. There's some restaurant in White Lake that on like Tuesday nights, you can go and you can get up on stage and they just have like free stage time for whoever wants to come up and play an instrument, play the guitar. He wanted him to sing. He's been doing some like Nirvana stuff. And he wanted to come up and like have him play one of his songs and sing. And Caden totally turned off. It turned into the biggest stress ever. Did not want to play guitar. All of a sudden, he's timing himself. Like usually I'll be like, oh yeah, you're pretty much done now. It seems like it's been about 40 minutes and he still wants to play. Well, it got to a point where he did not want to play anymore. So I was like, you know what? You don't have to do this right now. You're fine. Performances though can cause stress. So once we turned that off and said, don't worry about that right now, all of a sudden it turned back into a stress reliever for him where he enjoys going to it. 
Same thing with people that sing. If you're ever going to perform, you know that that's something that also causes stress. Same thing with sports. That can cause a stress if you're on a team and you need to make sure that you're performing well. So yeah, typically, and what he found was usually a stress reliever was doing something that was exactly the opposite of what was causing your stress. Do you agree? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Usually if you do something that's the opposite of what's causing your stress, that can be a stress reliever, okay? So if you're very high energy, moving a lot, maybe sitting down and doing something like yoga, at least for me, is a huge stress reliever. Well, we are, being human, we're made of molecules, right? And so what he found was, if we behave in this way, then do molecules also behave this way? And guess what he found? They do, okay? They do, absolutely do. And what he did was, he tested reactions inside of flasks and beakers, and he applied different stresses to them. He waited until the reaction came to what is called equilibrium. And a lot of people think that equilibrium either means equal, okay, it doesn't mean equal. Actually, a lot of times people will see reactants to the left of the arrow and products to the right of the arrow and think that when you put reactants into a flask or a beaker, it automatically goes complete to completion and then it comes to a stop. Does a reaction ever completely stop? Do those molecules actually stop? No, it may appear to stop, but even in like a desk and the solids that you have around you, your pencil that you're holding, are those molecules moving? Yeah. Yes, but they're just vibrating past one another. Okay, so they're moving very, very slowly. So they don't actually come to a stop, but what we say is there's no net change. So once you have your reactants, your, a certain number of reactants and a certain number of products, they're still maybe switching back and forth, but there's no net change anymore overall. Okay, so overall there's no net change. So what he did was, once he got to the point where there was no net change and it, it, the system had reached an equilibrium, it looks like it's come to a stop, he ended up changing a factor and checked to see what does it do, okay? So now, for me, if someone comes over and pushes down and causes a stress on me and pushes on my shoulder, I'm going to do what? I'm going to try to do what? Anything to relieve the, the stress. Whatever it is that's going to relieve the stress, I'm going to try to do. So maybe if somebody pushes on my shoulder, I might actually just come down because that's going to relieve the stress and it won't hurt as much as me trying to push back up against them, okay? So um, he ended up studying that to check to see how do these molecules work. So his principle states, when stress is applied to a system at equilibrium, the system will shift to relieve what? The stress. Awesome. The different, three different stresses, and um, I always like to do the play with like the numbers and the letters and stuff, and I thought this was kind of cool. In his name and the principal, it's C, T, and P. And two of these, you will probably know. The C will hold off on for a second. What, what, do you, what type of stress do you think that T stands for? But, but I, I mean, uh, no, a stress as far as molecules go, so you have a container, a flask. I may have heard it, I'm not sure. Temperature. 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 Thank you. Nice. I think you said it like a bunch of times too. Thank you. Temperature is the one that's going to go in the middle. What do you think the P is? Pressure. Pressure. Awesome. The C would be where you actually alter the number of moles that are going in. So maybe you have uh, Country Time Lemonade and you can either add more of the substance or you can add more water to it. So maybe you add more of the powder to it. What is that called? Making it more? Concentrated. Concentrated. Nice. It's concentration. What if you add water to it? What is that called? It's dilution. Diluting it. Good. Perfect. That's diluting it. So concentration, not like, hmm, let's concentrate. It's not that kind of concentration. It's concentration as in you're going to add more of a substance, and the more that you add, the more concentrated it becomes. So it's how many moles you've added per volume, per unit volume. K. K is called the equilibrium constant. Chemists express the position of equilibrium in terms of numerical values relating how much on either side of the arrow. So what are we relating on either side of the arrow? To the right are called? Products and to the left are called yeah. reactants. Good. How many products you have versus your reactants? And typically you do what you end with versus what you've started with. 
okay? Whenever you're doing neck types of things. We're not going to do a calculation with this. We're just going to get an idea conceptually of what would happen. Look at the reaction below. Lowercase a, b, c, and d would be what we called the coefficients when we were doing balancing equations. Anybody remember what the coefficients represents? You can just say it. Amount, but there was a certain amount we called it something. It starts with an M. Moles. Yeah, moles. Perfect. Those represent moles. And capital A, B, C, and D are just our different substances that we have. The equilibrium constant is written K with the subscript EQ for equilibrium. So EQ for equilibrium. So that's the ratio of what did we say? Concentration of what to what? What are we comparing? Well, we end with products versus reactants. Good. P versus R. At equilibrium, with each concentration raised to a power equal to the number of what? Which is? Represent moles. Perfect. So the number of moles. Very nice. Okay. If you're looking at this reaction right here, C and D would be representing reactants or products? Products. 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 Remember, it goes R A P, RAP. So these would be our products, and the scientists will use brackets for concentration to represent concentration. So then, what are A and B? Reactants. Again, you don't have to do the math of this, but I am going to ask you a math question here. If you have more products than you do reactants, what math rule could you tell me about K? What does K always have to be? If your P is a bigger number than your R, in other words, you run your reaction and you find out that you have more products than you do reactants, even a little bit, even a tiny bit, what rule can you tell me about um, K? You can just call it out. K will always be multiplication. Perfect, greater than one. It will always be greater than one. Try it. If this number is 100 and this number is 50, is it bigger than one? Mm -hmm. Yes. What if this, these numbers are really close? Like this is 100 and this is 99.9. .9. Will it still be bigger than 1? Yeah. Yes. As long as that top number is bigger, it's automatically going to be bigger than 1. So if you have more products at equilibrium than you do reactants, then K will be greater than 1 if you have more products at equilibrium. So then that means if you have more reactants than you do products, what do you think? K will be less than 1. Not negative. Negative exponents, but not negative. For example, 2 times 10 to the negative 2 would be 0 0.02. Okay? That's not a negative number. It's a negative exponent. So that's 0 0.02, meaning it's less than 1. So if you have more reactants, then K is less than 1. Okay? So that's the only rule with K. So then here's the first question. What happens if K is equal to 1? Then what? Yeah, P and R are the same. Perfect. Your concentration of your products must be equal to the concentration of your reactants at equilibrium. Okay, that's what it means if they're equal. So if K is greater than 1, we said that means that there are more what? If it's a bigger, if this, more products. Good. What we say, bless you, is that we favor the products. For example, when we say favoring, it's almost like if you've ever babysat and you kind of favor one kid over the other, and yes. so you slip them a little bit more of the snack than you do the other kids, or maybe you're like, you know what, you can stay up a little bit later than everybody else does. So that's what favoring is. At equilibrium, which one do you have more of? Okay, And that's what that means, is when we say favoring, because you're going to hear me say, which one will you favor? That's what, it, that's what that means, is which one do you have more of? If it's less than one, that means there are more reactants, so we would say that we favor the reactants. Let's try this, and then I'm going to kind of go, maybe I'll just go down a row, that way I don't have to call names out. So I'll just come up a row, I was doing like every other person before. Okay, so if KEQ is 1 times 10 to the second, then um, that's 100, right? Let's do a couple of them as class. Uh, if K is equal to 50, would that favor products or reactants? 50. Everybody. Products. Products, because it's more than one. How about 0.5? Yeah. Reactants. How about 100? Products. Products. Um, 50,000? Products. Products. 1 times 10 to the negative 4? Reactants. 
7.0 times 10 to the 6. Products. Products. Good. Okay, so let's try doing this. So I'm going to start second row in the back, and then we'll just come right back up. Okay, so um, 1 times 10 to the 2nd, which is equal to 100, so what would that be favored? Products. Very good. Next person, 0 0.003. Reactants. Nice. 6 times 10 to the negative 4. Yeah. Reactants. Good. It's less than 1. That's like 0 0.0006. 3.5. Products. Very good. 300? Products. Very good. 0.2? Uh, product. I mean reactants. Sorry. Reactants. Nice. 1,000? Products. Products. Very good. And then let's do the first person here. Oh, reactants. Nice. Very good. Easy enough? Okay, let's just get down to the bottom of this page and then we'll take a break. Good? Um, no, no, it can be any. It can be oh. anything greater than or less than one. And then if it's equal to one, then that's where you would say that, that they're both inside of your flask. You have the same amount of both of them in there. Oh. Your reactants and your products. Okay. Concentration. Changing the amount of gaseous or aqueous reactant. Aqueous. What stem do you see in there? Aqua. Aqua. That means dissolved in water. That's what aqueous means. It means that it was put into water. As long as you have a gaseous or an aqueous reactant or product, it will disturb equilibrium. Solids and liquids will not. Okay? So just write S comma L, put an X through it. Solids and liquids will not disturb equilibrium. So if you have a solid or a liquid in a reaction, it doesn't, it needs to be there. It will be produced, it will be used as a reactant, but it's not necessarily affecting equilibrium. Unless it's something that's actually dissolving into the water and becoming aqueous then it will, but besides that, it's not going to affect equilibrium. So you can actually like ignore it when you do equilibrium questions. Our bodies maintain an equilibrium between how much CO2 and H2CO3 there is. When we exercise vigorously, we rapidly exhale what? CO2 to keep the acid concentration of the blood within a safe range. Your body naturally has these equilibriums and it regulates, it just naturally regulates. And so what is one major thing if you're going for a run or playing a sport or something like that where you would probably die if your body didn't regulate this? Water. Oh, I Breathing. Breathing. I'm hearing breathing. I'm hearing your oxygen levels. Sweating. Perfect. What is sweating? They say that sweating is a what process? Cooling process. Very good. So what happens is your molecules on the inside will actually release energy. So how do you feel on the outside? Hot because they're giving off that energy, but on the inside your molecules are actually cooling themselves down. So they're giving off that energy. And that way you can still stay alive. So your body naturally does this also. And this is something that could be very dangerous if your body didn't do it for you. You have a certain amount of this here is carbonate. So carbon-8, you would change 8 to, when you're doing acids, you would change it to? Ick, good. So that would be called carbonic acid. Good, because it starts with an H, that would be carbonic acid. So this has an equilibrium. Notice it's only 1% versus 99% of carbon dioxide in water. So your body naturally will have only 1% of this and 99% of this. Now what happens is, if you start exhaling your CO2 and you're losing too much CO2 too quickly, what do you end up having a higher percentage of? What, what is this reaction? Acid. In this reaction, what do you have extra of? I heard it. Carbonic acid. Good. If you exhale too much CO2 too quickly, then your percentages are now different. You have too much of your H2CO3 in your blood. Guess what your body will naturally do? It can't, just, it, it can't just emit the acid out through your pores, okay? That's not happening. Guess what your body does? Sends it to your liver. I didn't hear what you said, Michael. You vomit. What do you do? You go for a run and then you just start vomiting? Everybody just starts vomiting? You start to no. slow down. You get thirsty. What does your body naturally do that it can do with this reaction? Breathe heavier. Breathe more. Go back to what? It'll turn back into what? And? Carbon dioxide and CO2. Yeah, it will actually turn into these two. That carbonic acid will naturally just turn right back into those. So if your body senses that this is too high, this percentage is too high in comparison to this, it will turn this into CO2 and H2O naturally, okay? 
If you have too much CO2 and H2O, guess what it does? <laughs> Perfect. Turns it back the other way. Okay? It can actually go back the other way to create more carbonic acid until it comes to equilibrium. It's almost like being on like a seesaw. Now I want you to keep in mind though that it's not equilibrium is not really equal. Okay, but if there's too much on one side, so let's say that there's too much on the acid side. It wants to actually come back to become equal again at equilibrium, not really equal, okay, but at, to its equilibrium. So what it's going to do is it's going to lose this stuff, but when it loses this stuff, what happens to this stuff? It. You gain more. As this stuff is lost, it's actually decomposing. It's converting back into CO2 and H2O. Okay? And then the other way can happen as well. Sometimes you have too little of something. Maybe, maybe something's coming off, and that's what we're going to talk about in just a little bit. There's a reaction that you can do to produce fertilizer, or even if I was telling you that my in-laws have a chicken coop, and um, my brother-in-law, the, the hens lay eggs, and guess what he does to get the hens to lay more eggs? It's a very simple thing that you can do to get the hens to lay more eggs. What do you think? He mixes the... Um, no the mixing. Hen, the hens with the rooster. No mixing. He doesn't, have, he doesn't even have a rooster. Oh, he doesn't even them. have a rooster, just the hens. Injection. Nope, no injecting. Like, Guess what he does with the eggs? <laughs> <laughs> he takes them. He takes them. Nice. He takes them. Hen comes back and Hen wants to sit down to warm her eggs. And guess what? Her eggs are gone. So what does she do? Lay more eggs. Lays more eggs. Okay? That's how they can increase the yield of eggs naturally without having to do any injections or anything like that. You just take them away and then the head lays more eggs. Okay? So, not really. No. No. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, so, as soon as the CO2 is added, as soon as you have too much CO2, it reacts with the water to form more what? If you have too much of this, then what does it do? It forms more? Carbonic acid. H2CO3. The eggs are basically It uses using the water up also though. Okay? So it uses the water. If you have too much CO2, it actually reacts with the water because you can't just get CO2 to form H2CO3 alone. Do you agree? What else would you need in order to make the, carb the carbonic acid? You can't just take CO2 and just convert it. It needs to react with the water in order to make the H2CO3. Okay? So it's not going to just do it alone. If you add a product, so this is one of my little like tip things. If you add a product or you add a reactant, it's always going to shift in the opposite direction. So it's kind of like the seesaw. You add to this side, what it's going to want to do to come back to normal is it's going to want to increase on this side and decrease on this side. Okay? Guess what happens if you take something away? Those of you that are siblings, maybe you have, uh, like, a, uh, if you're a girl, you have another sister, or boy, whatever, you have another brother. In my case, it's my son with my husband. He started taking my husband's shirts. He's got, like, really nice Nike workout shirts, and he started taking his. And my husband's like, where are my black and white Nike shirts? And Caden's like, I took them. What do you do when you take somebody else's stuff? You're hiding it. You put it back. <laughs> you put it back, okay? So what's going to happen here is if we take something away, like the eggs, if you go to take the eggs away, the hen wants to lay more eggs. Naturally, it will want to lay more. Same thing here with the chemical reaction. If something comes away, we actually want to add it back. We're going to say that we're going to favor that side, okay? So if you take it away, you're going to want to put it back. If you add to that side, it's actually going to shift opposite because now there's too much. That's like the seesaw thing. There's too much on that side. It actually wants to shift in the opposite direction so that it can come back to equilibrium. So if you add a product, it's going to actually shift opposite, and it's going to uh, favor the reactants. The same thing happens if you take away a reactant. You want to put it back. So everybody, if you take something away, you do what? Put it back. Put it back. Okay, on the same side. If you add it, you're going to shift opposite. If you remove a product, take away a product, you want to put it back. So that means you're going to favor your products. And then um, it's going to shift, uh, or if you add a reactant, it's going to shift toward the products. So we talked about the eggs. Let's try this now. Okay. So here's an equation for fertilization, for a fertilizer. So we have H2N2 yields 2NH3. 
If you add NH3, now there's, and let's write this first, RAP, R-A-P, because I don't want you to get it wrong because you're calling, you're calling reactants products and products reactants, okay? So now there's too much on this side. What's going to happen? What are you going to favor? Reactants, good. It's on the product side, so you're going to favor the opposite, which is reactants. You take away nitrogen. If you take this away, everybody, when you take something away, you want to put it back. So guess what side you're going to favor? Reactants. Awesome. You add H2 to the flask. Now there's too much H2, so now what's going to happen? You're going to favor? Products. Good. It's going to go opposite. Okay. I'm going to do another one of the rows. I'm going to start in the second row there, and we're going to just come up. Okay. I'm going to ask you similar questions. So we're going to just go through these. And then you tell me if you're favoring the reactants or the products. Okay, again. So if you add, it goes opposite. If you take it away, put it back on the same side. That's the side you're going to favor. Okay, so let's start off. I take this stuff away. If you take it away, you want to? Put it back. So what side would it favor? Products. Good. Next question. I add this to it. Good. It's going to go opposite. I take this away. Good. Put it back on the reactant side. I add this stuff. Um, reactant. Good. It's going to go opposite because there's too much on that side now. I take this one away. Products. Products. Put it back. I add this one. Products. Good. Um, I, uh, I take this one away. Reactant. Good. Put it back on the reactant side. I'm going to come to your row real quick here. I add this stuff. Products. Good. I take this one away. Reactant or product. Good. Put it back. Um, I take this one away. Reactant. Good. Put it back. I add this stuff. Uh, Very good. And last one. I take this one away. Oh yeah, you can you can answer that one. Take it away. If you take it away, why? You're right. You want to? Put it back. Awesome. Okay, good. So we're going to take a break, and then we're going to do um, the back side. So, okay, so um, we're talking about Le Chalier's principle. So I just want to do a quick review of this first page before we move on to the second, because if you've got the first page down, the second page is super easy, all right, especially dealing with the temperature changes. So we said that Le Chalier's principle is basically talking about how molecules uh, basically react to what being applied to them. Stress. Stress. Very good. And there are three major types of stresses. And what are those three? Concentration, Concentration temperature, 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 and pressure. pressure. Awesome. So those are the three. So we already talked about concentration. We talked about K also. We said that if K is greater than 1, that means that inside of your flask, you have more what than the other one. If K is greater than 1, you have more? Products. Products. Very good. If K is less than 1, that means you have more? Yeah. Reactants. Yes. Okay. So remember, equilibrium doesn't mean that they're equal to each other, and equilibrium doesn't necessarily mean that the reaction has stopped. It looks like it stopped, it's just that there's no net change. So we talked a little bit about that. Then we're doing the concentration stuff, and we said the major idea is if you add to one side, your reaction is going to want to shift to the other. It will actually use up both reactants, though, in order to shift. So even if you're just adding one of these, it's actually going to react with that one until it's all used up to make more of this. If you take something away, everybody, you need to put it, put it back. Then it goes on the same side. So if you add to it, it goes opposite. If you take it away, you're going to put it back on the same side. Questions? Yes? For the expression, um, if you put the substances for the letters, like how would you divide the substances by Yes. You would actually do the concentration of, but in, if you take AP, then we'll get into a little bit more of that. So you would have a certain concentration. It would say that it's like a two molar concentration or a one molar concentration, and then you'd be multiplying and uh, raising it to the power of the moles and things like that. So we don't have to do any of that right now. Okay. All right, so just making sure that you have the conceptual idea of what's happening here. Temperature, before we do this, there are two major words that I want to make sure that you know, and many of you may have heard it, but maybe it was a long time ago, and some of you this may be new to you. There are two words, and I, there's one stem that we talked about a little bit earlier, dealing with temperature, heat changes, and temperature changes. What is that stem, talking about temperature and energy and things like that? What word, what stem of a word? I heard it. Therm. Like what? Thermal heat. 
Thermal heat. Oh. Thermometer. Good. Thermometer. Good. Thermometer. What else? What else starts with therm or has therm in it? Thermos. Thermos. Good. A thermos. A thermostat. Nice. A thermostat. Thermal underwear, um, which maybe your parents call long johns. Um, so yeah. Yeah, there's, there's that whole, and, and basically you're just talking about heat, heat changes, things like that. So that therm step. There is a word that we use in science that refers to heat leaving or heat exiting or losing heat. Anybody know? Exothermic. Nice. Let's start with that. So on the top of your page, we're going to do half of this. We're going to talk about exothermic, and then I'll do a squiggly line, and we'll talk about endothermic on the other side. So right here, this exo part of the word, um, some of those words that will help you remember it are like what? Exit. Exit. Okay, leaving. Losing. The symbol that we use for energy or heat is delta, which delta means what? What do we say delta means? Change. In H, which is for heat, okay, delta H. And if it's leaving or exiting or you're losing it, what sign do you think that would be losing? Minus. Minus. Negative. Very good. Delta H is actually negative. And when you're losing things, we don't actually, we talked about this before, you don't actually use minus signs in a reaction. You can only use plus signs in a chemical reaction, okay? So there's only plus signs. So either if it's coming in, it goes in on your reactants. If it's something coming out, it comes out on your products. So therefore, if it's exothermic, do you think it would be going in on your reactants or coming out based on these words on your product side? Out, so you would actually say plus heat. Okay? It can be written in different ways. Either it's written right into the reaction. Sometimes that's actually given a unit. You can use joules, kilojoules are units of heat that we use. Um, anybody else know an energy unit, like your food energy? What do we use? Oh, calories. calories, kilocalories, very good. So you might have like 75 kilocalories. It'll say plus 75 kilocalories, okay? Or you can have a sign that's outside of your reaction and it'll say positive or negative and have a number there. And if it's positive then, well, let's do if it's negative. If it's negative then, then your reaction is? If it's negative, delta H, your reaction is? Everybody. Exothermic. Everybody say it. Exothermic. 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 Nice. Okay, so if it's negative, it's exothermic. So let's do the opposite. What is the opposite called? Endo. Endothermic. Nice. Okay, and endo, what are some words that kind of sound like it? Mm. Into. Into. Good. And what else? Um, enter. Enter. Nice. I like enter. Into. Gaining. Okay, gaining. So exothermic is losing, endothermic would be coming in, into, entering, that's gaining. So if we're writing um, the delta H, what sign do you think goes with gaining? Positive. Nice. So we get a positive number like a positive 97 kilocalories, okay? Or a positive 103 kilojoules, something like that. That would mean it's endothermic, and it actually is gaining energy from its surroundings. So it actually, as the reaction proceeds, it requires energy and it takes energy in for that reaction to happen. Otherwise, if it's exothermic, how do you think that would feel on the outside if those molecules are giving off all of their energy? Similar to you sweating, how does that feel on the outside? Hot, good. When those molecules lose energy, for example, it feels hot on the outside even though the molecules are cooling themselves down. So that's positive. So if we are writing a reaction, reactants, arrow, products, so there's our wrap. Then if it's entering, again, we don't use minus signs. If it's entering and coming in, what side do you think the heat would be on? Yeah. The reactants. Perfect. We would have heat right there on the reactant side. Okay. So if you increase the temperature, it causes the equilibrium position to shift in the direction that does what? What does it always do? It always relieves what? Stress. The stress. Perfect. Whatever it is going to do to relieve the stress that relieves stress, it will do whatever it takes to relieve that stress. So, if you add heat, then it's similar to what we were doing before, it's gonna shift to the, what, opposite side. Nice, what if you take it away? If you take something away, you put it back. Put it back. How do you take away heat? Cool. You cool it, 
Perfect. You put it into a refrigerator, okay? So cooling it down would be, so versus heating it would be putting it on maybe what? Stove. A stove or a hot plate or something like that. That would be adding heat or supplying heat, okay? So the thing that we're going to do now is we're going to look at the reaction, but it's almost like you have, don't imagine these as two separate containers. This is one container and it has reactants in it and it has products in it. Depending on where the equilibrium sits, you might have more of this stuff or maybe you have more of this stuff. It also depends on the temperature. So in this case, this reaction is called, if the heat's on the product side and it's losing heat, giving it off, we would call this reaction what? Exo. Exo. Nice. That one's exothermic. So there's our heat on the product side. So what happens if you add heat? Well, if you add heat to this reaction, which way is it going to shift? To the reactants. Good. To the reactant side. It's going to shift opposite. What if you cool it down? If you cool this reaction down, that's taking away the heat, you want to put it back so it's actually going to favor the products. Okay. It says, what happens if you heat the exothermic reaction that's written here? We said heat is on what side? Product. This is RAP. Yep. R-A-P. So even though this is double arrow where your reaction can go back and forth, the way it's written is reactants, arrow, products, always. Okay? So it's written as RAP. So heat is a product in this case. So if you heat it, then what's going to happen? You're going to actually favor the opposite. the opposite, the reactants. Good. An endothermic reaction would look like this. It would be heat plus R yields P. Maybe you have two products, okay? Maybe you have a first product and a second product. It doesn't really matter. If you heat an endothermic reaction and I start adding heat here, now heat's a reactant. Which way is it going to shift, shift now? Product. To the product side. Okay, that's going to favor the products. And that's it. Okay, so you're going to treat temperature the same exact way that you treat a substance. If you add it, it goes opposite. If you take it away, put it back. Put it back. Okay. All right. Changing the pressure, it only affects a system with an unequal mole ratio. An unequal mole ratio. What um what do where are the moles inside of a chemical reaction? Where are the moles in a chemical reaction? Uh, what part of, the of a balanced chemical equation are, are the moles? Coefficients. The coefficients. Very nice. The coefficients are, um, are what you're looking at here. So the only thing is, it only works for the gaseous or the aqueous ones. So again, this does not apply to solids and liquids. It doesn't apply to solids and liquids. Imagine the following cylinder. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you a little analogy here in a second here. Imagine the following cylinder and you have a movable piston. So this can go up or it can go down. And here's time A where our cylinder is pretty much open and at the top. And then you're going to push the piston down. And so whatever is inside of here is going to start um, getting closer and closer together, which means you're increasing what inside of there? The, what, the pressure. Good. The pressure is increasing. But what do we do to the volume of it? Yeah, we decrease the volume of it. So you can see they're actually inversely related. Here, we have a higher volume, and if we have a higher volume, what can you tell me about the pressure inside of there in comparison to that one? Lower it must be a lower pressure. So those molecules can move about more freely. There isn't as much pressure that is on these molecules than what is on these inside of here. So you push down on the piston, and what happens to the pressure on the gases? It increases. Well, your system wants to relieve that stress that was put on, okay? So it's going to try to work to oppose whatever that stress was that was put on. So my analogy to this, I have three brothers, and I was kind of forced. I ended up enjoying it anyway, but I was kind of forced to watch Star Wars, okay? So any of you who have ever watched any Star Wars movies, I don't remember what episode it was, but there is a certain scene that every time I see this, I kind of start thinking about it, where... Um, they're, they all end up in this like garbage compactor type of thing and C3PO, tell me if you kind of know what I'm talking about, yes? Okay, and C3PO, they're trying to get his attention, trying to get this to stop, but the walls are coming in. The walls are coming in and there's this crazy like tubular thing that's coming out and, and it's, it's starting to like grab them and pull them down under this nasty liquid garbage compactor stuff, whatever. So the walls are coming in. 
if the walls were coming in, it's very like anxiety. You start to feel this like, oh my gosh, the walls are coming in on me. Do you want more people in this room or less people in this room? Less. less. So you're like, get out. Half of you get out. You need to start getting out. As many of you, right? So when the pressure, when the walls start coming in and your pressure starts to decrease, or your volume starts to decrease, the pressure inside of the room actually starts to increase. increase okay? And so what you want is you essentially want less people in the room. What do you think my analogy is going to relate to? You want less what? Perfect, but what do we call them? We said that what was represent Moles, nice, nice. You want less moles, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to count on both sides, the reactants versus the products. We're going to count our moles, and we're going to check to see. If there's a higher pressure, guess what you want? More moles or less moles? Let's talk about people. If there's a higher pressure, meaning that we've decreased the volume and there's a higher pressure, do you want less people in the room or more people in the room? Less. Less. Okay? If you have a bigger room, you're like, yeah, bring people in. We're okay, right? So if you have less pressure or a bigger volume, you can have more, more moles. Okay? And that's the way that it's going to work. And so in comparison to each other. So, um... I'm going to say more is less and less is more. In other words, more pressure, you want the side with less moles. Less pressure, you want the side with more moles. Okay? So that's going to kind of be my little tip on remembering it. So everybody say more is less, less is more. More is less, more is less, less, less is more. more. So we're talking about pressure though, okay? So, and pressure is the opposite of volume, so be careful because you might be asked about the volume. So, if you're looking at this one, we have a lower pressure, so less is more. more. So, in this case, because I'm going to write less is more, so I want more moles. This here doesn't have a number in front of it, so what coefficient is that? <coughs> no, if there's no number, one. it's a 1. Good. That has a 3, and that one has a 2. So how many total moles, this is my reactant side, this is my product side, how many total moles do I have on my reactant side? Four. How many total moles do I have on my product side? Two. Okay. So I want the side with uh, less is more, I want the side with more, so which side has more? Four. Yeah, the reactants, very good. So that means that I... I'm going to favor or have more of the N2 plus 3H2, which looks like N2, I have three H2s inside of here. So I have one N2 and three H2s in there. Remember, it's moles though. And every mole has actually how many molecules? 6.02 .6 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay. Even though I'm just representing this as one, it would really be a lot more. So it's not like I just have four molecules inside of there. Okay. Here, if I increase the pressure, more is wow. less. I want the side with less moles. And which side has less moles? The products. Very good. So now I'm going to favor the 2 NH3. So now I'm going to draw NH3 and NH3. If you notice, if I count, remember to balance the equation, your number of atoms should be the same on both sides. Here I have two N's. How many N's do I have in this situation? Two. two. How many H's in total here? Six. 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 Two, four, six. How many in total here? Six. six. Three plus three. But notice, this is going to be more compact. And that's why this would be a relief of stress. Even though you're, you're actually not taking out the molecules in this case, it's just a rearrangement of the molecules. And having less moles ends up being um, less pressure. Okay? It relieves the stress of that pressure. So how is equilibrium affected when pressure is applied? What does pressure applied mean? Does that mean increasing pressure or decreasing pressure? Increasing. Increasing. So let me just write this here. So if you increase pressure, we're going to say more is less moles. Okay, so let's count. Here I have two on the left, and then I have two and another one on the right. So on the left I have two, and on the right I have three. So which one's less? Two. two, which means I'm favoring reactants. Okay. All right, last thing. Let's go to the worksheet. You're only going to do the front side, not the back side. Okay? Only the front side. Um, one and two you can do. That's just right from your notes. 
Let's try this one together. Let me stagger it for a minute here, okay? So go ahead and try some of these. Now, you notice that there's a salad. Salads, it's needed for the reaction to take place, but it doesn't actually affect equilibrium. So I'm gonna kind of put a little slash through it just to remind myself of that. Okay, so you can see this reaction and you can see that there's H2O and heat, the carbon solid obviously needs to be there in order for the reaction to take place. But um, try these out and then I'm gonna ask you in maybe about 30 seconds. So only the front side of this worksheet, this is the one that you picked up today. Is this homework? Just the front side. And a lot of you will probably be able to finish it during class too. Okay. So let's try lowering the temperature. Lowering the temperature is the same thing as doing what? Adding it or taking it away? Taking it away. Okay, so on the count of three, I want you to tell me, R-A-P, whether you believe, hopefully we all get this right, whether you believe you're going to favor the reactants or the products. Remember, if you take something away, you want to put it back. Okay, ready? One, two, three. I'm hearing a mix of both. Let's think about this again before you answer, okay? Because I'm not hearing everybody. You lower the temperature, which is like taking it away. You said when you take it away, you want to put it back. Put it back. Ready? One, two, three. Reactants. Good. That was much better. Reactants. Awesome. Okay. So if you take the heat away, you want to put it back. It is a reactant in this case because it's endothermic. Adding carbon solid. Nothing. Because it's solid, it's actually not going to affect equilibrium. Very nice. Okay. You add H2. On the count of three, I want everybody to tell me reactants R or P. One, two, three. Yes. If you add it, it's going to hear you both. If you add it, you want to go opposite. Good, I heard both. Reactants is the only answer. You take away H2. You remove H2. Everybody, products, put it back. Your K is equal to 2.3. What do you think here? It's greater than one, good, products, nice. So if K is greater than one, it favors the products. If K is less than one, it favors the reactants, which might be something you'll want to write on your note card um, for your final, okay? That's probably a good thing. Maybe you could even do an example, as long as you don't have polyatomic ions in your time. This one right here, I just want to talk to you real quick about this, and I'm gonna have you try it on your own, okay? If your delta H is negative, what did we say? Negative is like losing. So perfect, exo, very nice. If it's exo, would heat go on your reactant side or would heat go on your product side? You might have to look back at your notes if you don't remember. Losing, you lose things on your product side. So this would be plus heat right there, okay? So now you can treat it as one of your reactants or one of your products. Okay, go ahead and work on this and then um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about um